This is the, um, the seventh antiphon, the seventh great O. This would be um, sung on the night before um, Christmas or Christmas Eve. O Emmanuel, the king and lawgiver, the desire of all the nations, the savior of all people, come and set us free, O Lord our God. If we uh, had our hymnals at our next door and you open it up at the f- bottom of the page, you would find some information. And um, the first name that would appear would be John Neal, who was a clergyman. And he published uh, this as an English translation in 1851. And it was titled Veni, Veni, Emmanuel. And he was translating from Latin into English. And he believed that he was translating a prayer that was from the 12th century. Um, But he didn't have a written record of that. What he was translating from was from a book of prayers and songs inspired um, by the Council of Trent. And, um, And this was one of those prayers that very obviously had been inspired by the great O's. Um, Neil translation actually begins, draw nigh, draw nigh, Emmanuel. Uh, even though the most straightforward would be come, come, Benny has come. Uh, somebody else came and changed it, and we don't know who, but we're probably all thankful that this person did, and they wrote, O come, O come. Now, Neil was working with another clergyman, Thomas Helmore, and Helmore is the one credited with taking a tune, which they said was from a French missal, and it was a tune that was called Plain Song, or that's what they called it, and the melody that we get when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, which is part of the beauty of this hymn. There's, I, I'm not an expert on, on hymnology, but I'm pretty sure that in our hymnal, there is not one other hymn that uses that tune. Um, a lot of them will use the same tunes, but, but, but not this one. Now, there was a Cambridge scholar who was a nun, and her name was Dr. Mary Berry, and in 1966, she was doing some research in France, and she discovered that there was a 15th century Franciscan processional, most likely used by nuns during funerals, and that is the earliest record that we have of the actual tune or melody that gets sung. And Helmore and Neil, maybe somebody else, but they took this tune and they applied it to this hymn. And there are many different verses and and there's different versions. And it's kind of an interesting thing where there's at least six, seven, maybe even more different verses to the song. And typically none of them have, have all seven. But what you will find is, is that 
The O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is all of them. There's, there's one other name that gets added, and it's in our, it's in our hymnal, and his name is Henry Coffin. And um, he added a couple of verses, and, and in particular this verse, O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here, which is part of, in our hymnal, part of what we sing. And that came later. It wasn't part of the 1851 version, but it came, I think, about 30 years later into the story of this hymn. But in all of the versions, in all of the hymns, what becomes very clear is that what inspired it are these great O's. Because you will find in these hymns, in all the verses, whether there's four or five, or if you end up looking at a bunch of the ones and then you get to seven or eight, you will find these words scattered about. O wisdom, O Lord, O root of Jesse, O key of David, O radiant dawn, O king of nations, and O Emmanuel. When we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, with this carol, we are reaching back into probably our oldest traditions of Christian faith and worship. Um, Boethius, in the early 5th century, 6th century, which is early 500s, he made reference to these great O's, and so it meant that they were already being used in worship. And... um, One of the things that we're going to do is, if you're on the church's email, um, we're going to send out to you. And if you if you're not, here's our little pitch: Um, if if you get on the church's email list, if you want to be on that email list, um, we're going to put together a little devotional. I'll do this where if you would like to utilize the great O's for worship in the seven days leading up to Christmas. Um, I'll put in a little thing where there'll be a scripture, there'll be a psalm, there'll be one of these great O's in the order that they traditionally are. We're climaxing with O Come Emmanuel on, I think it's on Christmas Eve. And, um, And this will be one way that you can spend a little bit of time preparing your hearts to make room for Christ this Christmas. For today, I want to focus on what comes first in the song and comes last in the prayers. Um, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. These words are most directly inspired from the prophet Isaiah. I read for you just a little bit during uh, the reading, but I'll I'll, I'll read just a little bit more. Um, Matthew picks it up and tells us about this, but but this is a part where um, I'm going to read from Matthew or Isaiah chapter 7, beginning in verse um, 13. I'm just going to read it, and then I'll give you some explanation about what's going on here. Then Isaiah said... Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and your people and on your house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. I remember something of of reading this when I was in high school. And um, I wasn't a Christian yet, and I was kind of learning something about that Christmas had to do with Jesus. I did not know that as a young person. And, um, and, and then I heard, you know, that, well, it's, it's about this, 
this stuff. And so I remember the first time I read this, I don't remember quite exactly how old I was. I was like, this makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, I, I get the part where when I get into the Christmas story and then we're told, you know, Emmanuel means God with us and the angel tells Mary and all of this. It's like, oh, okay, this makes perfect sense now, kind of. But um, so Isaiah started prophesizing probably sometime in the 740s BC, right at the end of when King Uzziah died. And, um, and, and, and then his ministry lasted for probably a little more than 40 years. He, he was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah, but he prophesied both about Judah as well as Israel, but his prophecies were directed towards Judah. And he had a hard call. Um, he was warning against the demise of the kingdom. And, um, you know, I, I think about this and I think about it a little bit, you know, of, so like, like a parent, God speaking through Isaiah is speaking to his people and he wants his people to choose life. He wants them to choose the way of life. But he knows that sometimes they're going to be really stubborn and they're not going to choose the good. They're going to have to learn a hard lesson. And, and, and so Isaiah comes and he, and he sits there and he's like, okay, so if you keep going this way, if, if you do this, the land's going to kick you out. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be taken into exile. It's, it's going to be terrible. But in the middle of it, there's some hope. One king, Hezekiah, he turns and, and, and a reprieve is given. The, 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 north, the northern kingdom it, it gets laid waste during Isaiah's reign. It shakes the people, but while well, they remained faithful, they were at the temple. Everything they were doing, well, not really. They weren't doing exactly what God wanted, but they mostly were doing what God wanted. So everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be... And it's like, no, it's not. If you keep going this way, it's not. A king's going to come, he's going to lay waste to you, it's going to be terrible. But, and this is what you get with Isaiah, you get, you get two things. You get exile, and you get hope. But the hope is on the far side of exile. I love you, and I'm for you, and I'm going to be with you. But you might have to learn some really hard lessons and it might be really difficult for you because you're refusing to listen to me. And um, that's what we find in this song. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Ransom captive Israel. Exile is reality. But there's hope. Exile is not the whole story. And the thing is, is that this theme of exile that we find in the Old Testament, we find again in the New Testament. And in fact, the reality of exile is part of your and my reality. It is part of this Christian life. You're broken. I'm broken. The world is broken. Sometimes we're stubborn. Sometimes we don't listen. And sometimes it's really, really hard. But in the midst of exile, in the midst of something like the wilderness of chaos and emptiness and despair, where you're confronted with your weaknesses and your failings, not all is lost. Did you know that God does some of our best, some of his best work in us in exile, in wilderness, when we get stripped down, when we're reminded that we're weak and that we're broken? Exile can be a time of purification, a time of anticipation, a time of both healing and hope. 
And so the New Testament says that right now you and I are living in exile. We're not home. Right now the world is not the way that it's supposed to be. Right now you and I are not experiencing life at its best. We are in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. This is not our home. But we're making our way towards the home because we're in Christ and Jesus is the one who's taking us home. There are key features of understanding exile. It doesn't feel good. Let me give you a feel from what the Israelites experienced in captivity, what Isaiah prophesied before it happened. He knew this is what it was going to be like, but this comes from Psalm 137. This is testimony of what it feels like to be in exile. And it, a little bit of history reminder, the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722 by the Assyrians, and that was a wake-up call for the people of Judah, kind of, Hezekiah, for a time, did a little bit of reform, and it, it pushed the same thing off for them a little bit while longer. But in 586, the walls that couldn't be breached, the temple, which was the temple of the one true God, which was not ever going to be destroyed, or at least the people thought. In 586, the Babylonians came and all of their hopes and all of their dreams were wiped out. And not only were the walls breached and not only was the temple destroyed, but a large portion of the population was taken off to the capital of Babylon. And this is the testimony of some of those captives. This is Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept. When we remembered Zion there... There in Babylon, on the poplars, we hung our harps. I don't feel like singing. The world is broken. I'm broken. We're in a foreign land. This is not good. But our tormentors demand songs of joy. They said, probably with a very mocking tone, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land? And, and that question, how can we sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land? I mean, it's one of the things that we are going to go through seasons that are something like exile and wilderness and brokenness and despair. For some of these Jews, it wasn't just a fleeting feeling. For some of them, it was the reality of 50 years of their life. How can we sing when we're broken and the world is broken when the question before us is, why God? Why? How can we sing? This isn't the whole answer. I don't think I can give you the whole answer, but this is part of the answer that we get as we look at exile in Old Testament and New Testament. What's very clear, and this comes through the prophet Isaiah, is that we are not in exile because of God's incompetency or that he lacks sufficient power. This isn't what God wants for us. This is not God inflicting us with pain. This is the reality of God allowing us to experience the consequences of our choices or the consequences of a broken world. Not everything that we experience is up to us, but we can't blame God for this because God loves us and he wants the best for us. But if we don't listen to him, if we go our own way, well, you end up in exile. That's one part of it. God's not incompetent and God doesn't lack power. And this is also really important for when we turn the corner to hope. But we're not ready to turn the corner to hope because there's another part of exile that you and I have to experience. In exile, it is an opportunity and not everybody takes it. But it is an opportunity for us to turn inward 
and to realize some of this, not all of it, but some of it is me. I'm broken. I've made mistakes. I'm not the easiest person to live with. And in exile, we have the opportunity to get to a place of honesty with ourselves. Not everybody does it. And, and, and this is part of the tradition that we have in, as far as just in Christian worship and Christian life and in spiritual formation. Part of the season of Advent is a time for you and I to, to repent, to change our minds, to, to see ourselves in the light of Christ, to, to, to get honest with ourselves Exile gives us the opportunity to look inward and get honest. But exile is only part of the story. It is not the most important part. And that's where we sing. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Ransom captive Israel. And we get to this place where we can rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And we know this because even in the prophet Isaiah himself, exile is part of the reality. It's part of the story, but it's not the most important thing. Let me read for you Isaiah 40, because in Isaiah 40, you get a turning point in the book of Isaiah. You get these warnings of exile. You get these warnings that God's judgment is going to come. You get these warnings that it's going to be hard and terrible. You get a little bit of a story of reprieve, and it's a historical story where Hezekiah does a little bit of reform. But this is just a Band-Aid. But the Band-Aid is important. God doesn't want us to suffer. God wants the best for us. Again, the imagery as a parent, there's two ways to learn a lesson. One way is you learn it through somebody else. Or the other is is you're going to have to learn it yourself. And often when you learn it yourself, it's way harder. It hurts. I don't want to see you hurt. But if you don't listen, it's going to hurt. And all of that, chapters 1 through 39, is that. But at chapter 40... And this is quite amazing because, you see, Isaiah, he only lived a little bit beyond, he lived into the 690s most likely. And what he promises here and what he speaks here is on the far side of exile for Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem. And what we're talking about is we're talking about at the very least something like 530 B.C., which is like more than 150 years after his death, we hear this. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, The true fulfillment of Isaiah does not come until Jesus. And then we realize, oh, we were at, Isaiah was talking about, in one part, the physical exile of Israel, but another part, he was talking about the reality of spiritual exile of humanity. A voice of one calling in the desert. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain will be made low. The rough ground shall become level and rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And this is the beginning of the prophecies of the return from exile. Rejoice. Rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. And you and I, we stand on the other side of the fulfillment or the beginning of the fulfillment of that prophecy. Emmanuel has overcome the world. And so, 
you and I now live with a new light. And what Jesus wants to give us is a new standard by which we see and live in the world. Life is more and greater than we realized. The world is broken, but there is a way of healing. The world teaches us to rely on our own strength and our own wisdom. But the gospel of Jesus says that that is foolishness and rebellion. Come home to Jesus. Come and learn to walk again through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let go of the standards of the world. And instead, allow the light of Jesus to teach you, to give you wisdom. Allow Jesus to give us strength. If we look at the world through the world's standards, we will misunderstand and we will think that the people right now who are winning are actually winning. But winning according to the world is losing and losing according to the world sometimes with God is actually the greatest victory. This comes from Alexander McLaren who was preaching more than a century ago. And he, and he gave this little illustration. I thought it was quite funny. Do you remember the old story about the soldier that shouted out that he had caught a prisoner? His officer said, well, bring him along. And the soldier answered, but he won't come. Well, then come yourself. And the soldier answered back, he won't let me. <laughs> and his point is, is that there are many people who think that they've won but in reality, they've been chained by the world. You and I are not living by the world's standards. Instead, we are the people who say, O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Ransom is safe. Ransom is come and pay the price that you and I cannot pay. And Jesus came, and from the world's standards, at that time, it looked like he actually failed Completely and miserably, he was crucified by the Romans. But what looked like the greatest of failures was, in fact, the greatest victory. You and I, what we need to do is we need to call to Jesus and we need to allow him to become the one who gives us light, who gives us wisdom, who gives us power. You see, what looks like failing right now what looks like exile and wilderness, in Jesus, it is not the whole story. He is the God of the impossible. And so sometimes, even though God didn't want you to suffer this, being in exile, going through hardship, failing according to the world, Jesus can pick it up and he can actually do some of his best work in you. And so when you're feeling like this song that has a tune that comes from a funeral where you're mourning and you're wondering how you can sing, but you're holding on on faith and you can say, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. And if you can, if you can hold on to that, if you can just sing it, it's going to be Jesus who gives you the strength and the ability to then ultimately get to the place where you can really sing, rejoice, rejoice. For God is with us and he is for us. When you look at Emmanuel, when you say these words to Jesus, what do you see? Look at your wounds, look at your brokenness. How does he see your wounds and your brokenness? I want you to close your eyes and I just want you to imagine you're, you're praying to Jesus and you're saying, oh, come, Emmanuel. Come and rescue me in my brokenness. Come and do for me what I cannot do. If you were to see his face, what would his face be looking like? What would, what would it reflect to you? Let me tell you what it, he doesn't do. 
He isn't looking at you with anger. He isn't shaking his finger at you. He isn't, he isn't mad. If there's tears in his eyes, it's tears of compassion because he doesn't want you to suffer. But there's a smile there too. He sees you and he sees you as he, you are. And in your brokenness and in your wounds and your weakness, in your trouble, in your hardship, it pains him. He is the God who is with us and he knows what it's like to suffer. But there's also a smile because he knows that it's not the end of the story. He's going to come and he's going to bind up those wounds and he has the strength to heal. And what's right now, this momentary feeling that feels like defeat, he is going to rescue you. And so he calls us to pray, to invite him in, to lean on his strength and his wisdom, to let him be our savior. Let me encourage you to stand up and let us sing this song.